Hello YouTube Frogs, Mr. Slimes here to bring you another guide video, this time on Eula, the newest character released in Engine Impact. Those of you who have missed my polls, link in the description for my previous poll video. We polled C6 Eula and R5 Pines if you want to check out, you know, how it went. But today we're going to get into the guide video on Eula. This is a quick run through of my Eula. Level 80 out of 80. She's currently 2 Bloodstain, 2 Pale Flame. You can see the artifact sets here. I'm running an off piece sand piece because I have energy recharge on this piece. We're gonna be using a physical damage goblet, one of my best pieces, I guess, that I've been um, blessed with. And we're mostly going to be using a crit chance mask. For the serpent spine in particular, we're gonna be switching to a crit damage mask because we're gonna be over capping uh, on crit rate if we do serpent spine. With that being said, I'm gonna be using this crit damage mask. You guys can see here that the crit rate is exactly a one to two with this crit damage. So 13.2 divided by two is 6.6. .6, and the attack percent is around the same. So it's pretty, pretty good comparison if I swap these two for the serpent spine. And you'll see that my stats are as follows. Ignore the attack because this is gonna be variable based on the weapon. Um, but we'll point out uh, all the details. We're going to be hovering around 70 crit rate. In 80% of the test, we're gonna be 69.9 crit rate. With 165 crit damage, our energy recharge is on the lower side, but it's like the bare minimum. Your Q is not gonna be refunding properly with 120%. I recommend a little bit higher. I would recommend around 130, 140%. Uh, 160% feels really good, but it's hard to get that. And then the physical damage is gonna be dependent on weapon as well, okay? this is These are all the stats that we're gonna be using, hovering around 70 crit rate for all these tests, all level six. And we're gonna be testing. If you guys have been checking out my YouTube community post, which I've been trying to post like relatively frequently, you guys will probably see that um, I am I'm testing out one, two, three, five star weapons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four star weapons, and two of the three star weapons. Yes, I invested a crap ton of weapon crystals in order to enhance these up, but I think this gives you guys the best practical view of all of these weapons in action. As much as you know, you can do calculators and optimize all this stuff, nothing is better than seeing the numbers in front of your face. Albeit, you guys might not have the same artifacts that I do, but you guys can still see with these same exact artifacts, how does each weapon perform in the corresponding uh, tests that we're going to be doing. Okay, a uh, quick run through of Eula. She is what I would consider a nuke DPS. She is fairly consistent, probably 75% physical damage, 25% crowd damage. Her talents, her normal attack scales as it normally does uh, for any Claymore user. The E has two phases. There's a press damage and a hold damage, right? So we'll be going into my personal recommendations on rotations later, but we see that press and hold damage are 205% and 344%. And with holding the E, you have a physical res decrease and a cryo res decrease. And I want to point out that if you do manage to get these res decreases off of getting two Grim Heart stacks, it applies before this hold damage occurs. I actually tested this out and I was surprised because you can see that the hold damage here is 344%. The skill damage from the Q is 344% as well. So I thought they would be doing the same amount of damage, but it turns out hold E actually does more. And it's because the cryo res decrease applies first before the hold damage applies, okay? So the passive talents, we have Roiling Rhyme. If two stacks of Grimheart are consumed upon unleashing the holding mode of Ice Tide Vortex, a shattered Lightfall sword will be created that will explode immediately dealing 50% of the basic physical damage dealt. So this is basically saying, uh, when you do combo wise for the E, when you hold E and you consume two stacks, you do additional damage. That's basically what this talent does, right? And then this one is really important. So this actually fits in with the rotation with her. When the Q is cast, the cooldown of her E is reset and Eula gains one stack of Grimheart. So this is very important. And I'm going to be putting on the screen uh, the rotation that I'm going to be using for testing. This is very important. For most, if not all the tests, I'm going to be testing Q at zero stacks and Q with full combo. Full combo is around 12 to 14 stacks of damage. That's about what you should expect when you're doing a full combo. And this is the way that I do the full combo. So I initiate with an E, Q, hold E. So that means I start with a tap E, the press damage E, then I press Q, and then I hold E. And when I hold E, I'll already have two stacks. So the first E gives me one stack. When I press Q, this passive gains me the second stack and the E is reset. So I do E, Q, hold E, that's two stacks of Grim Heart, which allows me to consume it and gives an Ice World brand that deals crowd damage to Nero by opponents. So all of this consumed at the very start of the Q to give the maximum boost to the damage as possible because we get the physical and the crowd reduction immediately when we start. And then I do a normal attack sequence of one, two, three hit, four sources of damage. I dash cancel the fourth one. And then I do one, two, three hit again. And then I can I finish it as much as possible, if possible. But for most of the tests, you can only do N3 
times two for most of these tests, which gives you four plus four stacks, plus the hold E, which is the ninth stack, and then plus additional passive stacks from the Ice Tide Vortex, okay? So around 12 to 14 stacks, give or take, all right? Now, for Broken Pines, I have additional attack speed. I actually get a N3 plus N4. So I get the N4 on the very last one. You'll be able to see in all the clips, okay? So that's the test methodology. Let's go through the constellations. C0 to C6. If you are a dolphin whale player and you're considering getting constellations, what do I recommend? So if you get C1, you get a 30% physical damage increase when the Grim Heart stacks are consumed. This is basically during the queue, right? When you consume the stacks. During the queue, you get basically the full duration of the queue gets all of these stacks. So if you do C1, 30% physical damage, depending on how much physical damage you already have, I have 127%. So 30% boost here is about 15% damage. So on average, I would expect if you're doing a physical damage cup with two bloodstained, two pale flame, then C1 gives you about a 12 to 15% damage increase. If you have 100% physical damage, then 30% damage gives you 15%. So 15% is, I, I think, the cap that you get from this. C2 is what I would view as uh, beneficial to energy recharge. So if um, you want to get C2, this helps her get her ult back faster because when you do the EQ hold E combination, the hold E is on cooldown for a massive amount of time. If you want to improve the energy recharge, you can continue pressing E every four seconds instead of 10 seconds, which is what the hold E is. So that's a pretty significant difference, right? Four seconds to 10 seconds. That's just for energy recharge. And then obviously plus three levels, plus three levels. C4 is additional damage below 50% HP. It's less consistent than C1. Uh, but it's additional damage, right? And then C6 is obviously big Q, right? This is to maximize the Q damage if you want to show off and do a million damage or 4 million damage or if you want to achieve like, you know, world record space, then that's what you would do for C6. If I'm going to recommend Constellations, I think that C1 is a great place to stop at. C2 if you're feeling really frisky and then none of this is necessary until C6. So C1, C2 is okay for energy recharge and then C6 for the big damage. Between these, not worth the additional like thresholds of money in order to get it. So yeah, that's my opinion on Constellations. All right, so before we get into the testing, I'd like to briefly go over her attack rotation. There's a lot of extensive testing that went into this, but I'm not gonna bore you with that in this video, okay? Quick notes before we get into it. Each normal attack that you see here, including the ones that are split into two that you see here, all count as individual stacks. So the full rotation can give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stacks if you do the full rotation, right? You do the first three, you get four stacks, plain and simple. Second, the E can provide up to four stacks. The first is from the skill damage. The second and third are from the Ice World brand damages, which you can get two of if you have two Grimheart stacks, one that says it right here. And the th fourth one is this one. If two stacks of Grimheart are consumed upon using your E, a second Lightfold Sword will be created that will explode immediately. This counts as a stack. So that's up to four stacks with the whole E, okay? So the combo for 0% attack speed is as follows. E, Q, WASD cancel, N4, Hold E, N4, two pops. This grants you two Grimheart stacks from here. N4, five stacks. Hold E up to four, depending on how min-max you are. Uh, and then N4 is another five stacks. So up to 13 to 14 stacks, um, depending on your mechanics, your precision with the, uh, executing this combo. So the two important notes, one is the WASD tap canceling right after the Q. This removes the end lag of the Q and allows your auto sequence to start right away. The second is to hold E to cancel the first N4. The better you execute this, the easier it is to 13-14 stack. Now the last thing, which I did not mention, is incredibly difficult, both in practice and in field, is delaying the second N4 after your hold E to wait until the hold E gets all four stacks. Most of the time, your first auto from the second M4 will overlap. Min-maxing this is really difficult, but it gets 14 stacks at 0% attack speed. I was unable to do this after many hours, all right? So the sequence that you may be seeing on the screen uh, will demonstrate my attempts, and you'll be able to see 13 to 14 stacks. Now in these demonstrations, I use a level 20 sword, so I don't kill the Registrite. That's where you see the damages. All right, so if you have the Song of Broken Pines. Remember to auto three times in the beginning to access three sigils so that when you post Q and you auto, the fourth sigil will come right away and get your attack speed. So that's a small little reminder. Uh, the general attack sequence that I just described is available all the way up to 24% attack speed and which there's a different sequence. EQ, WASD cancel, N3, hold E, 
and 5, which can get up to 15 stacks. 14 is the usual for that one. I'll probably be making a follow-up video on mastering Eula, quote, which goes over the combos and playstyle rotations and details. Like and comment below if you'd like to see that. Alright, so, on to testing. Keep in mind, for simplicity, I'm not using any of the combos I described. I'm using a simple EQ hold E rotation so I can see the auto damage post resistance shred from the hold E. Okay? Alright, that is the details. We will be starting off with these three star weapons first, comparing Debate Club versus Skyrider Greatsword. And then we have Energy Recharge weapons, Sacrificial Greatsword, and Favonius Greatsword. And then we'll be moving on to F2P weapons, Prototype Archaic versus the Snow Tomb Star Silver. After that, we have the kind of BP slash Star Glitter shop weapons, Black Cliff Slasher versus the Serpent Spine. And then we have unique weapons, R5 Lithic Blade, which we won't be able to get many party stacks because she is from Mondstadt. And then in my recommendation for supports, I'm going to pair her up with Diona for the test wise. She is also from Mondstadt. So at most you can get two stacks, but I'm actually only going to do it one stack test because... I find that most of the supports that she deals with are all from Mondstadt, but I'm gonna add Zhongli because he's a universal support if you do have him, um, that he can fit onto almost any comp, and he is from Liyue. So that's gonna be a one stack lithic blade test. And I know, you guys are like, why did you level up this weapon? Listen, I was baited by my Twitch chat, and now it's here, so I might as well test it. If you saw my tweet, I regret leveling this up, but you know, we're, we, we have it already at R5 level 80, so I'm going to throw it into the test. It's gonna be in there. It's gonna be compared with all the other weapons. Just, all right, just bear with it, okay? Anyways, so for the five star weapons, we have R5 Wolf's Gravestone, R5 Skyward Pride, and only R1 Broken Pines. Yes, I do have four copies with Broken Pines, but for the sake of this video test, I'm only gonna stick with R1 because if I refine it to R5, then I can't do composition tests later with R1 weapon. And I wanna be able to do that. So for the purpose of this test, I'm gonna stick with R1 and I will do the calculations for you on average, if you do upgrade to R5, how much damage boost it's going to be. Skyward Prime is going to be a singular test. Wolf's Gravestone is going to be two tests. So we're going to be testing the Q damage with no Wolf's Gravestone proc and Q damage with the Wolf's Gravestone proc. So you can see what the damage difference is if you manage to proc it. Albeit the proc is relatively inconsistent because it only can occur every once every 30 seconds. So the uptime is less than 50%. But still, if you manage to do it, you can time it to get getting a big proc. Okay, those are the weapons choices. Test methodology. I want to give you guys a run through of how I'm going to be testing uh, all these weapons. So you guys can see my team comp here. I'm going to be running three cryo units on this team just for my purpose of energy recharge because i have to press q in this video like 20 to 25 times with all the weapon tests i will be using crit rate food but please keep in mind this does not affect the damage output okay this just increases my consistency of crit rate to make it easier for you guys to see the crit damage numbers which is what we're going to be comparing with everything okay so that's why when you see if you guys see a food buff at the bottom it's because i'm using a crit rate piece not only do i have this crit rate food but i'm also using double cryo on my team and for the later part of the test i'm gonna be using diona e to apply cryo before i do my full combo to guarantee that i'm at 100 crit why am i guaranteeing that i'm at 100 crit because my oh my when i don't crit and i have to reset it wastes so much time please understand that i'm doing this to save my time and also it doesn't affect the damage output so if i had food buff with the 20 percent crit and the 15 percent cryo i will be at 100 crit so the clips that you'll see from the weapon tests will all be crit damage weapons and mr cope will be able to much more easily compare the two in terms of damage output okay sound good all right let's get into testing all righty for the test the first weapon that we're going to test out is the debate club so with the debate club i'm going to switch over to it these are our stats we have 1.8k attack 69.9 crit rate 165.8 crit damage 120 recharge and 108.3 percent physical damage bonus so those are the stats here let's see how she performs all right so for a three-star weapon i would say the debate club is not that bad um, 81,000 full combo damage. We don't have any remnant to compare to. So 81,000 is a pretty like standard amount of damage. You can see that the three-star weapon with those stats performs that well. You can basically full combo, right? During the duration of the ult. Let's see Skyrider Greatsword. All right, obviously with the Skyrider Greatsword, our base attack is lower. So we're at 1600 attack because the debate club has 32% attack passive. But keep in mind that the Skyrider Greatsword is very efficient. On hit, normal charge attacks increase attack by 10% for six seconds, max four stacks. During the Q, you'll be able to get up to 40% attack, which is fairly massive for a three-star weapon. Every single thing about this weapon is synergistic with how Eula performs. 1.6k attack, same 69 crit rate, uh, 165.8 crit damage, 120 recharge, and 148.4 physical damage bonus. 
the full combo with the full passive is able to break 100,000 damage. That is very massive over the debate club. So if you do have the Skyrider Greatsword, it is a very efficient free-to-play weapon to use. And also, it doesn't aesthetically look that bad. You see, like, the, the color scheme fits pretty decently. It is still blue scheme. So... Consider the Skyrider Greatsword. I think it's a very solid three-star choice, and you'd be surprised at how well it performs in comparison to the four stars. So, that's the three-star comparison. You guys can see that both of them maintaining basically the same amount of stacks. If we have 40% attack with the proc, it should be slightly over the Debate Club because the Debate Club has the same base attack, but 32%, right? So you can view that with the Debate Club with 1800, the Skyrider Greatsword with proc will be slightly above 1800, maybe like 1850 about. So those are the two three-star weapons. Let's get on to the four-star weapons. We're going to begin with the energy recharge weapon. So Sacrificial Greatsword up first at R5 level 80. Now, with these Sacrificial Greatsword stats, you can see that the Sacrificial Greatsword has high base attack at 497 with lower recharge. So we have 1887 attack. 69, 165, same crit rate, crit damage. Energy recharge is now at 150%, which is higher and more what I recommend. Let's see how she performs. So we can see that with the Sacrificial Greatsword, our Q full combo is doing 84,499 damage. All of the minute details for the normal attack, tappy, holdy will be also shown, but I'm going to be comparing full Q damage because that's what people are looking at. We're looking at massive damage output, yeah? You can see that Sacrificial Greatsword is a little bit stronger than the Debate Club, but it is about 15% weaker than the Skyrider Greatsword at full procs. So, uh, with the energy recharge from the Sacrificial Greatsword, I'm personally not really a fan because the cooldown on the E is already very low, right? You're just doing, just hold duration, it's four seconds. And then while you're doing cooldown, of the hold E, you're going to be in your Q form anyway, so I don't see the need to reset it because holding the E reduces the amount of attacks that you can do overall, so consider that. Let's move on to Favonius Greatsword. So with the Favonius Greatsword, we see that our base attack is 100 lower than the weapon, but the energy recharge is about doubled. With these stats, our attack goes down to 1700 attack, but our recharge increases to 176.6% recharge. So with the lower attack, but the higher recharge means that we can loop our Q much faster than other weapons. And also Favonius weapons, you guys understand, have team utility as well, right? So not only am I having massive amounts of energy recharge, which allows me to loop my Q, which, you know, consistent DPS is where the Q comes from. If you can proc it every 20 seconds, 80 energy cost is a massive amount. So Favonius Greatsword, if you're not looking for big damage, but more consistency, Favonius is definitely an option. And uh, let's see how it performs. With the Favonius Greatsword, we see that the damage is much lower, right? The Q full combo does 70,187 damage, albeit is even lower than the three-star weapons, but we have to take into account, not only are we lacking base attack and none of the passive increases the base attack, we are able to loop our Q much more effectively than the other weapons. I would say probably 1.5 to 2X more efficient on the Q uptime. So if you are not looking for big damage numbers, then consider Favonius for general team utility and also refund of the ult back. I would, in comparison to the Sacrificial Greatsword, I would actually use the Favonius Greatsword more just because Favonius weapons have always been a staple for high-end gameplay when you're trying to refund your Qs all the time for your entire team. Eula doubles as both a battery for the team as well as herself in this case. So uh, if you're not looking for massive damage output more for refund, then Favonius is not a bad choice. With that being said, let's move forward to more of the damage-based four-star weapons. Beginning with the prototype Archaic. We have 2,088 attack. So this is not only high base attack, but also attack percent. And the passive is a little bit of an extra hit. Maintaining the same crit rate at 70%, 165. Recharge is back down to 120. And physical damage is 108%. You can see that the Q full combo did 93,488 damage, which is, albeit lower than the Skyrider sword, but still consistent damage. The passive we saw did 12,184 damage, and this occurs every 15 seconds. So you can view it as an additional 12K proc when you Q. Standard weapon, as always, has always been the standard. Does decently well, better than both the recharge weapons so far. Weaker than the Skyrider or Greatsword because it doesn't have the passive proc, it doesn't have physical damage. Now, let's move on towards the Snow Tombed Star Silver, which is the other F2B weapon that I chose to use. Not using White Blind just because I think these two options are much better. And this one you get from one of the Dragonspine quests, so. 
Our stats are lower attack, 1887. Same crit rate, same crit damage, 120 recharge. The physical damage bonus is increased slightly to 139.8%. Let's see how it does. We can see that the passive, which is opponents affected by crowd are instead dealt 200% of the attack. We got 10,563 damage. This occurs every 10 seconds. So it's about roughly the same as a prototype. Prototype was 12K every 15. Snow Tombed is 10K every 10 seconds. So it's slightly more efficient. And also, I mean, it aesthetically looks pleasing with her and also the q full damage did 97,259 damage which is slightly more than the prototype archaic the reason is probably because physical damage bonus 31.5 percent is a decent boost while we're lacking attack we do gain more in the physical damage bonus department but we can see that the cryo damage the e and the q initial damage both the cryo portions did less but that is because instead of attack percent we have physical damage so we're increasing the physical output which is 75 percent damage but we're sacrificing some of the cryo so consider both of these options are both fair. Now let's move on to the Star Glitter slash BP. Black Cliff versus Serpent Spine. Let's begin with the Black Cliff Slasher. With the Black Cliff Slasher, we notice that our attack goes down tremendously, but our crit damage goes up to 216%, still maintaining the crit rate. With this type of build, we're going to be seeing more general damage because we're doing higher crits in general. So let's see how this performs. Keep in mind, with the Black Cliff Slasher, we are having zero passive stacks because we're not killing any additional enemies. If you had two to three stacks you'd be getting 24 to 36 percent attack buff at r1 which increases massively at r5 um so the damage output that you're seeing from the black cliff is the bare minimum that you'd be seeing and it still performs fairly well so we see that the q full combo in the clip it was 89,884 damage but i believe that i missed one stack because I'm, I'm comparing the damage to all the other numbers it's definitely lower than i would expect so if we increased it by one more stack of the q just on average uh, it should be around 95 to 96k so it's on par with the prototype and the star silver i would assume that it is supposed to be stronger than the arcade because you can see the normal attack and the e and q are all stronger but the q full combo should be stronger as well so that's the blacklist slasher the consistency i would say is lower than the star silver but if you can maintain the passive stacks it's going to outperform all right moving on from the blacklist slasher to the serpent spine now serpent spine um if we've been if you guys uh know this weapon is incredibly strong for a four star weapon probably one of the strongest in the game for four star weapons the reason is because of the passive so the passive gives percent more damage which is not attack percent it's not crit damage it's on the same column as additional damage so additional damage is anything physical elemental all damage is calculated on here so you can view the 108 percent physical damage as being buffed by this so with five stacks, which is what we'll be testing, we're going to be doing 30% more damage. Now with the Serpent Spine, I highly recommend that you have a shielder and that one is a perfect one. So uh, with the Serpent Spine, in order to be fair, we're going to switch over to the crit damage mask. This is the only time we're going to be switching to this. Uh, with these stats, we will be maintaining roughly the same exact crit rate at 70%. Crit damage is about the same as the Black Cliff Slasher, so everything looks pretty solid here. And with that, uh, our attack is still maintained at about 1700. So let's see how this performs. With the max passive stacks, 30% more damage from the Serpent Spine at R1. Our Q full combo does 106,000 damage, which is the highest that we've seen from all of the weapons so far. The first normal attack also does 7.5k, which is very massive. Both of the Taffy and the Holdy are doing massive amounts, 6k and 12.5k, which means that this weapon increases the entirety of Eula's kit by a massive amount, even more than the Skyrider Greatsword, which is the three-star weapon, which increased the physical damage bonus. The 6% more damage is also applicable to Cryo, right because it's all damage if you're doing a bp and you have eula definitely a super super strong choice to choose and i would say that it's like a no-brainer if you're doing four star if you don't have any five star weapon surface spine is a go-to and with more refinements this only gets massively more stronger right so if we were to refine this weapon uh at r5 we would be doing 10 percent 10 percent on five sets would be 50 percent more damage which is pretty insane right so that's uh serpent spine uh those are the two weapons i would say both of these are all damage boosts and they are both very powerful i would say serpent spine is definitely the strongest of the ones that we have tested so far now let's move on to lithic blade with the lithic blade uh we are having higher attack let me change my team really quick because i want to demonstrate this with one lydia stack so the thing about the lithic blade is that the lithic blade because she's from monstat and a lot of her like common supports are from monstat as well it's very hard to rack up the party member stacks from the passive here so in our specific case i'm going to change back to a crit rate mask these are the stats that we're maintaining 2200 attack 
with 76.9 crit rate. So the consistency of the damage is higher and we only have one stack here. So let's see how we do on the damage. The energy research is the same and the physical damage is the same, cool. With the Lithic Blade, we see that at R5 level 80, the Q full combo did 96,711 damage, which is about the same as the Black Lip Slasher if it had the same amount of stacks. But Lithic Blade was only at one second. This is R5. I would say that Lithic Blade is just a generic stat stick that's usable for her. You don't even need to consider the passive. The passive is great with giving you attack percent and crit rate, but even if you didn't have it, it would still perform on par with all the other four star weapons at R5, keep in mind, right? But if you had more Leah stacks, you definitely see more of a boost. But because she's from Monset and her supports are from Monset, I'm kind of leaning against this weapon to recommend. I would just use it as a stat stick. Personally, I also don't enjoy the aesthetic of this weapon. You know, because she looks good. We want to we wanna have her look good, right? So I, I might be inclined to recommend still like maybe the Star Tomb Snow Silver. So that is uh, the Lithic Blade. It's a unique weapon. Last four star weapon is the Bell. I mean, the weapon aesthetically looks pretty pleasing right? She has 20k HP, 1794 attack, still maintaining the same crit rate, energy recharge. She gets no buff from the passive, except the 24% increased damage. We're doing this weapon because we're completing the tests, okay? It's not... Anyways, let's, let's move on with the tests. Okay, well, you see, that is the bell being tested. Full Q, full combo. Did 75,587 damage, which is lower than even the Favonius Greatsword, which was the lowest, so the bell on the Q damage proc is the least amount of all the weapons. And the passive is nothing to write home about. Even at ref refinement rank 5, the passive has a 45 second cooldown. Maybe one day when we have an HP percent scaling claymore? Uh, I don't know, man. I leveled it up. It's, it's, it's what it is, okay? All right, so those are all the four-star weapons and three-star weapons. You guys can see here that the Serpent Spine ekes out at the top here at 106,000 damage. Uh, the F2P weapons are fairly solid. This one looks very good on her and also performs quite decently well, despite the passive being, you know, only every 10 seconds. I'd say it's just additional damage. Can't go wrong with it. Energy recharge weapons, I would recommend Favonius Greatsword over all of them for energy recharge. 176% was what I was getting. The energy recharge here is massive. The damage is obviously very, very low. Second lowest, only above the bell, which is no surprise. Team utility, a very high. Highest damage, F2P weapon, Star Glitter. I, honestly, between these two, I think this one's more consistent, but if you get more stacks for mobbing, for example, this is going to outperform. Let's move on to the five star weapon. So we're going to begin with the Skyward Pride R5. With the Skyward Pride, our attack is 2000 attack, higher base attack than uh, the four star weapons. Maintaining the same crit rate, crit damage. Our recharge is 154% with this weapon. And with the passive, we're increasing all of our damage by 16%. So this is on the additional damage bonus. After using the Q, the normal charge attacks creates a vacuum blade that does 160% of attack as damage. And this damage is physical damage. So it also scales with physical damage cup and all your bloodstain pieces and all that stuff and pale flame pieces, right? This lasts for 20 seconds or eight vacuum blades, which is the duration of our Q. So it actually matches it very well. Let's see how it performs. The additional vacuum blades from the Skyward Pride does a massive amount of damage. And we can see that the Q full combo did 9,500 plus 99,667 damage. So it does less than Serpent Spine less than the Skyrider Greatsword, but we get an energy recharge. And don't forget, this is very important. Each of the passive vacuum blades did 8,659 damage. And you have eight of them during the duration of our Q. So eight of the eight of those passive blades gives you an additional 70,000 damage on top of the Q full rotation. This is at R5. So it's a very, I would view the Skyward Pride as a well-balanced energy recharge, high base attack, additional damage bonus weapon, right? Because the vacuum blades are also potentially AOE. You can see that the Regisfine died relatively quickly, right? You can see like all the damage on top of everything means that you're getting a lot of blade damage and it's a jack of all trades weapon, master of none, I would say. Good recharge, good passive, synergizes very well with her, looks aesthetically pleasing, high base attack, and yeah, just solid damage. Let's move on towards the Wolf's Gravestone. So, so with the Wolf's Gravestone, you can clearly see that my attack is off the charts. 2,667 attack with the Wolf's Gravestone, maintaining the same crit rate, crit damage, recharge is still the same at 120% with physical damage bonus. With this, I'm going to be doing two separate full combo tests, all right? Uh, we're going to be doing a no proc test, which is going to just be damage without the 80% proc, and we're going to be testing it with the 80% proc. So, in order for me to proc the 80% on the attack buff, I'm going to be using Rosario's Q, take down the damage just enough so the Regisfine 
allows me to proc this before my Q bursts. All right, so let's get with the tests. Q full combo without the 80% proc did 119,409 damage. So that is very large damage, but considering the Skyward Pride's vacuum blades, it actually does less than the Skyward Pride's total damage with the passive blades. Because you really have to take into account, in order to make a fair comparison with this weapon, you really need to take into account the vacuum blades, and it synergizes very well with her. So with that being said, it does it is weaker than the Skyward Pride without the 80% proc. Okay. Now with the 80% proc, you can see that the damage jumped up to 173,000 damage. With this proc, this does more than the Skyward Pride damage. And I think that's expected, right? So the only problem is consistency of maintaining while also having to attack an opponent with less than 30% HP. It means that if you're doing a boss fight and there's nothing and you can't get it below 30% HP, you're not gonna have this 80% attack buff, right? And also this weapon does not give you the recharge. So with everything said and done, uh, Wolf's Grayson is great for a nuke damage weapon where you're going for the highest like damage proc possible or not highest, but like a very high damage proc. And that's very... That's very uh, suitable. But Skyward Pride um, with the vacuum blades and at the same refinement with the energy recharge gives you more rotational ability. So consider that with between those two weapons, okay? Now, let's test out Song of Broken Pines. The, the weapon that aesthetically is meant for her and also builds around her. We have 2,330 attack because this is the newest weapon which has the highest base attack in the game. At level 90, it is at 741. At level 80, it's 648. This brings us to same crit rate, crit damage. Energy reach is still 120%. Physical damage bonus is increased 127% with this right here. Uh, and you can also see that the passive gives you 16% attack boost. And if you do a proc here, you gain 12% attack speed. It allows you to get like an extra proc off in the uh, Q damage rotation, which is actually, it takes a little bit of like proper canceling to do. But yeah, you can, you can get an extra stack, which means your Q does a little bit more damage, but also, right, it benefits. So with this passive, I want to mention one thing with rotation, right? You, when you possess four sigils, they will all be consumed. So with this weapon, it's a little different. Typically, the rotation I would be doing is E, Q, hold E, and then N3 plus N whatever amount you can get, right? So that's a... Uh, that's the normal attack, four sequence or five sequence, depending on what you can get. With this weapon, you want to maximize the attack speed during her Q. So what I would recommend is you do two normal attacks first and the sigils stay when you switch off the field. So you do two normal attacks first, prepare, all right? Like do die on a Q or something. And then you can do auto E and then press Q and then hold E, then you do your combo. The reason why this works out is because you'll have three of these sigil procs that you'll notice in the clip of when I'm doing the damage. And then three sigil procs, which means that the very first auto that you do post Q hold E procs you the whole buff. So that maximizes damage. So again, auto, auto, switch to your characters, prepare. And then when you're ready, auto EQ. And then you'll have three out of the four. Then you'll proc it on your next auto and you'll be good to go. Cool? So let's see how much damage we do. So, as you can see here, that with the Song of Broken Pines at R1, we did 123,065 damage. I don't think I got the last proc in, so this could have been like 130k. But realize that the damage even at R1 is still higher than the R5 Wolf's Gravestone without the 80% proc. Right. Very important to note that because this is, it's inconsistent to get because it's not all the uptime, right? And also you require 30% HP. So Song of Broken Pines is eking out on top in terms of damage. Uh, but obviously if you get the Wolf's Grace, so massive rocket do 173k. So with the R5 Song of Broken Pines, I'm not going to refine it right now because I still need to do additional testing. But if you get R5, you're going to get 32% attack, which is 16% more here, right? You're also going to get 12% more attack speed, right? So it's going to be 24%, and then your attack goes to 40%. So at R5, you're getting 16 plus 20, which is 36% more attack and 12% attack speed at R5. So with all these buffs and your additional attack speed boost, I would expect you to also hit 160, 170k with the Wolf's Gravestone R5 proc. So the, R, uh, the R5 Wolf's Gravestone proc is going to do quote unquote more damage, but Broken Pines at R5, I would expect to do 25% more damage. So 36% attack buff will give you about 15 to 20% damage. And then the attack speed will allow you to get one to two more auto attack hits in, which would give you about 25, 27, 30% attack boost, a uh, damage boost. So that's a pretty massive refinement boost, I would consider, especially with the attack speed. 
So that's what it would be if you compared all these weapons together. But yeah, that should wrap up the weapon tests. We've gone through over all of them here. And we can see that the five stars, jack of all trades, good recharge, nuke based weapon, a weapon that is meant for her and also does consistent damage, lacks a little bit of the recharge, but ekes out with the damage massively uh, compared to all the other weapons. The attack speed also is also very fluid with this weapon, right? The attack speed is a very big bonus with the Broken Pines, especially at uh, max refinement. 24% attack means that you're attacking a lot more fluidly than you would uh, than you not normally do, which increases your damage output even with your normal attacks. So that's where it ekes out over the Skyward Pride in terms of comparing with the Vacuum Blades because the Vacuum Blades do a lot, okay? So that's uh, weapon test stuff. All right, let's go over artifacts that's really quick. We have four to discuss, Pale Flame, Bloodstain, Gladiator, Noblesse. Those are the artifacts that I would expect to see uh, on your Eula if you did build. Let's go over Four Pale Flame first, all right? So Four Pale Flame is the ideal build or the will build. It's not practical though, due to the difficulty of farming the good four piece. If you do get here, this maximizes your Q damage during your E rotation, giving you 50% physical and 80% attack. But when you're off the Q and your hold E is on a 10 second cooldown, Four Pale Flame suffers. This is mitigated with C2, because C2 gives you decreases the cooldown from 10 seconds to 4 seconds, which is the tap, which allows you to loop it consistently and maintain the 4 Pale Flame, but it's still difficult to farm 4 good pieces. Okay, so next is 2 Pale Flame, 2 Bloodstain. This is my highly recommended gear. You always maintain 50% physical with this, sacrificing 80% attack, which is most of the time just an 8 to 9% damage boost. So it's easier to farm also with a higher likelihood of better substats because you can always mix and match, right? It's a 2-2 two -two set. So I would recommend this for anyone attempting to build her for the mid to end game. So it's easier to farm with the higher likelihood of better substance to choose from, right? So 2-2 two -two sets are always easier to maintain because you have more flexibility of choosing your artifacts. Definitely what I would recommend for most Eulas. Let's move on to 4 Gladiator. So 4 Gladiator is a set that I don't really recommend, but you can still use. It maintains the damage of the normal attack, but you have a much weaker Q. I'm personally not a fan, but it's still usable. I would prefer that you drop two pieces of the four Gladiator and added two Bloodstain or two Pale Flame that make it a lot more well-rounded. That leads into the two two sets, right? So two Pale Flame, two Blood, plus two Gladiator is a default general DPS set. Can never go wrong with that. Replacing the two Gladiator with two Noblesse increases your Q damage, but sacrifices a little bit uh, of your normal attack damage. This is also a default build because Noblesse is a highly farmed dungeon. So consider that. Uh, all in all, though, if we're looking at artifacts as a whole, 2 Pale Flame, 2 Blessing is what I would recommend. If you can't hit that, prioritize at least one of those 2 piece sets and then go for a substat. So like crit damage, crit rate, and energy recharge, okay? All right, so on the topic of artifact set recommendations, let's go over main stat real quick, all right? We're talking about Sands, Goblet, and Circlet. Uh, it should be no surprise that the Sands attack person I would value at the highest level, but I also think that Energy Recharge is a very valuable stat on her, so Energy Recharge timepiece with good substats is also a suitable viability, right? I recommend 120 to 160% recharge if you can get it. So if you have like, for example, Wolf's Gravestone, I feel like energy recharge might be a higher priority given how much attack percent she already has. So consider those options for the Sands. Uh, for the Cup, physical damage bonus is the number one for sure. Uh, even with two Pale Flame, two Bloodstained. If you do have an attack percent goblet, I think it's fine with good substats, right? Especially if you can maintain two Pale Flame, two Bloodstained because then you're not suffering as much, but physical damage definitely puts you a little bit further in terms of DPS output. And then the circlet, crit rate for almost every single weapon. For the serpent spine in particular, crit damage is okay, but definitely I would recommend you try to maintain your crit chance to be relatively high because a lot of her damage comes from her Q burst. And if that doesn't crit, then you lose a lot of DPS. Cool, so that covers artifacts. Alrighty, let's quickly talk about compositions with Eula here. So Eula is kind of a greedy new character. So if I'm going to suggest comp building around her, it's to refund her ult as much as possible because her ult is a significant portion of her damage. In order to do that, Resonance is really important because it also grants her crit rate on top of it. So, right, you don't need to force yourself to get 100 crit rate um, because with double crow, you get 15%, as you can see here, right? If we activate double crow, we get 15% uh, extra crit rate against crow afflicted enemies, which is really straightforward with Eula. Double crow is necessary, uh, I would say. So, it's for a consistent comp. If you're going for a nuke damage comp, then you don't need double crow. If you're doing going for nuke damage comp, then with Bennett, with Xing Yan, you'd be okay. But let's start with a consistent comp. So, Diana is probably going to be the best friend for a lot of Eula players who have her, like for budget, because Eula was just given to us in the energy amplifier event like a week ago. So, with Diona, and you probably have Favonius, Warbo, or Sacrificial, hopefully. So, either of those energy recharge weapons helps Diona refund energy back to Eula. So, this is a great synergistic combo. 
And then for a superconductor, because a lot of enemies in this game have physical resist, like Ruin Graders, Ruin Guards, Ajdaha has one, right? The new the weekly boss has physical res. Pyro Regisfine and Cryo Regisfine have 30% physical res. I would say that the best superconduct teammate is official, right? Uh, with Oz, she has the highest uptime on consistently proccing superconduct. So definitely a fairly solid choice comp wise. These three I would view as the core, right? Um, so double crown with Fischl, very solid. I would say that Fischl is replaceable with Beto's support. It's just that she has high energy cost for her Q because her E is not very consistent, right? Lisa is also viable as a superconduct support, right? We're looking for superconduct supports here. Kaching is also doable as a sub DPS superconduct kind of support. So you can run that as like a double DPS, right? And then other characters that would be suitable in this last slot. Triple Cryo is what I've been running. So this is the team that I've been running right now. And this comp I find is very effective because Diana is your shield healer for this comp. Rosari is a crit rate buffer with high crit rate on her Q. Fischl is your superconductor and they all refund energy back to you. So you're getting 15% cryo buff, right? So you're getting 15% crit rate. Uh, and then the Rosaria also gives at max 15% crit rate. So at 70 crit, you're already at 100, 100 crit. Fischl is a superconductor. And uh, that's all you really need for maximizing physical damage from her. Forgot to mention, with Eula C6, if you have Eula C6, she also reduces physical res by 20% with her Q. Um, but that's only available at C6. So, only reminder. Other options. Zhongli. I think Zhongli is a very suitable character. He can fit on every single combo. I think we've gone over this in my Zhongli guide. But yeah, with the Geo Shield, uh, that is a shield that can reduce physical res, right? So Zhongli's E is one way that we can further reduce physical res. CC, shield ability, capability, survivability, etc. Everything's good about Zhongli. Fits perfectly into this comp. Um, you don't need to worry about like shattering or ruining reactions because it's just superconduct. It's fine. So that's Zhang Li. And then Qing Yan is also available. If you want to increase your physical uh, physical damage. The only way you can do this though is with her talent. I only have her level one, so I can't do it. But yeah, characters shielded by the sweeping fervors, you'll 50 percent increase physical damage. So if you want to do that or increase damage? Go for it. So other composition, obviously Bennett, right? If you uh, if you have C5 Bennett, not C6 Bennett, you can uh, t attack boost for Eula. Always a suitable comp. This is totally fine. Any cryo unit is capable. I would say that avoid Chongyun a little bit unless you want to do like a hybrid cryo physical. Uh, because China will convert your auto attacks to cryo, which is not the best interest because you're probably going to be running a physical oriented comp. K is also viable. I would say that the usual supports that we'd be mentioning, like Xing Shou, I would not use Xing Shou with Eula because I think that Xing Shou is so useful for all of your other comps. Electro Charge with Kaching, Vaporize with Hu Tao, or Yan Fei, or Freeze with Gan Yu. I think Xing Shou is too valuable in other comps and is not really beneficial. Like, you're gonna just shatter Eula. Yeah, so I would not advise Xing Shou for this comp, just so that you have more units, right? We're trying to use units. Because Eula can use units that other comps don't use, it's actually fairly efficient. Tar attack, I would leave not in this comp. And then all of these main DPS, I don't think would suit her playstyle. Rosaria's great, Jean's great, if you have, especially if C2 for more attack speed. Buff, um, buff on attack. Attack. Uh, Venti, I don't really think Cinder is as well with this comp. I mean, I think it would be better to use Secrets to group than to use Venti because I think Venti would be a little too high for trying to get as many stacks on our queue as possible. So I'd avoid Venti in this particular case. Superconduct, uh, double geo also works by the way. I think, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. Albedo, I think Albedo is solid. If you do decide to do a double geo comp like this, for example, and you're trying to rely on shielding, I think this is viable as well. If I were to recommend, I would stick to double cryo, if not more, right? You can also do double cryo, double electro. So if you do have like fireworks tar tag units that you've invested in, like Beto Fischl, Lisa, for example, you can run double electro, double cryo, because that'll also refund your ult fairly efficiently, right? Because double electro gives you orbs. So something like this wouldn't be bad because Diana is your soul shielder healer. And I mean, the refund capability is very high here. So Electro Synergize as well for Superconduct also gives refund and then crowd. So I think that uh, in order to get maximum Eula stacks, shielders are very important. Diana is very good. Johnny is amazing as always. Can't ever go wrong with him. Cool. So that wraps up party members with Eula. Like, uh, I might have forgotten some, right? But if you're doing like new comps, you're doing like esports based comps, right? Doing a massive amount of damage with Eula, you're gonna be running Bennett Xing'an for double pyro or Bennett Klee C2, right? If you have those available, and then finding Super Gunduck somehow. So that's the way you max my damage. Cool. So yeah, that's uh, compositions. All right, let's do a little bit of a comp showcase. I am actually going to use the Skyrider Greatsword for this. I want to show you guys the potential of this weapon. For any budget players that want to see, I did post on my Twitter of a 222k, but let's uh, demonstrate this. I'm going to be doing probably two comps. I'm going to be doing my triple cryo comp. We're going to be testing in Abyss Floor 12. 
right? Which is the toughest content in the game right now. I'll probably also showcase uh, Bennett John Lee damage. Try to do nuke damage and uh, everything else involved. All right. So with this, I'm going to be showcasing triple crowd comp that I've been using right now. Obviously, Rosaria is replaceable with uh, anyone, but uh, yeah, this is just to showcase three-star Skyrider Greatsword. All right, YouTube Frost. I think that wraps up the guide video to Eula here. We covered basically everything. We went over the weapons, we went over the artifacts, we went over compositions, and we went over a showcase. We also went over her attack rotation in order to help you guys out on how to optimize her playstyle. Took a look at everything. All my thoughts are, are in this video. So hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys very much for watching as usual. If you guys made it to the end, don't forget to like, subscribe. And uh, yeah, we're almost at 40k subs. Hopefully we can hit it soon. But uh, thank you guys so much for your support um, and we'll see you guys on the next one.